We've been listening our way through this uh, letter that's recorded in the Bible. It's from the Apostle Paul. It's to a church in Rome. And in this particular episode, chapters 9, 10 and 11, there's been no stiff upper lip from Paul. Right? He is a bloke who wears his heart on his sleeve. And his emotions are absolutely everywhere. So chapter 9, verse 2, he talks about being in great sorrow. Also in chapter 9, verse 2, he talks about being in unceasing anguish. If you look at chapter 10, verse 1, his heart's open. He says, this is the desire of my heart. And later on, he aligns himself with a guy like Elijah, who said, I've had enough. Take my life from me. And then in chapter 10 and chapter 11, he's been devastated about the obstinate disobedience of his people. And then being in this kind of spiritual stupor and Paul's here sunk down in all his sorrow and his little mind is then plagued with big questions here's the questions he's asked has God's word failed is God unjust how can God still blame us? Why have so many of my people stumbled? Has God rejected his people? Are they beyond recovery? Has God reversed his call? And in the depths of his sorrow, his soul is filled with a billion questions. And some of us know what that's like. Right now our Sorrow is making us anguished, um, maybe even angry. And in our anguished anger, we are questioning God. Now let me say, that is not necessarily a wrong thing, to question God. But when we question God, we tend to have a bias in us that leads us towards the wrong type of answers. If you're anything like me, we have a bent in us that tends towards um, superficial answers. So sometimes I don't actually want the right answer. I just want the answer that makes me look right. And sometimes we also have a bent in us that tends towards shallow answers. I, I don't actually want an answer that brings lasting change. I just want the answer that will bring some sort of change quickly. We are masters at the superficial and shallow, aren't we? Scrolling Instagram, smoking weed, fake tans, watching porn, buying clothes, losing your temper at the kids, binging Netflix, buying a bottle of Mad Dog 2020, changing jobs, going to the gym, redecorating the house. We have become expert at the skill of papering over the cracks of our sorrow with paper-thin solutions haven't we? But when, like Paul, your sorrow is deep, you need a solution that is deep. And what we've listened to in chapters 9, 10, 11 is Paul not just asking hard questions, but answering hard questions. But what we're going to hear this morning from the Apostle Paul is that the answer we need to our anguished, anxious, angry questions isn't actually an answer. The ultimate answer is not an answer. The ultimate answer is awe. That's what I want to show you this morning. The answer is awe. Have a look at Romans chapter 11 and listen from verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. Who's known the mind of the Lord? Who's been his counsellor? Who's ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him, and through him, and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. We, we don't need superficial answers this morning. We don't need shallow answers this morning. 
big questions need a big God? The answer is oh, I don't know if you noticed that first word in verse 33 is not actually a word, is it? It's just a sound. Oh. That isn't like a measured, pre-prepared answer. That's just the instinctive, automatic reflex of Paul. You know when you do that thing with your knee? Oh, it's the sound that a groom makes when he sees his bride walking down the aisle on the wedding day. It's the sound you make when you are driving the North Coast 500 and you turn a corner and you are just hit with this vista of Scotland's beauty. You been there? Oh, it's the collective sound a football stadium makes when somebody does something out of this world. <sighs> oh, it's the release of breath when your breath is taken away. It's the sound you make and it's what you say when you have nothing to say. And it's the gasp you give when something glorious takes you totally off guard. It's a reflex of worship. And Paul's got to this point in his letter where he is dictating it to someone else who's writing it down. But answering questions about God suddenly gives way to awe at God. He's no longer writing, he's reacting. Oh. Here he is in sorrow, in anguish, in questions about justice. But at the bottom of his grief, he lands on the pillow of the bigness of God. Oh. That is a small word that gasps at God's bigness. And that is, I think, what all of us need this morning. We don't need more superficial answers which you can get anywhere. We don't need more shallow solutions which you can get anywhere. We don't even just need answers from God. And I say that carefully. We need all at God. So what I want to try and do this morning is to just show you what Paul is reacting to. And it is a massive thing, but I want to try and summarize it in two small words. I want to show you first, Paul is reacting to someone deep, and he is then responding to someone unique. And we're just going to look at these two things, okay? He's reacting to someone deep. That's the first one. Look again at verse 33, or listen. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond Tracing out. Paul is reacting to someone deep. Anyone here, one of those people that hates swimming in the sea because you don't have a scooby what's beneath you? Anyone like that? More or less, no, I love it. I have a total fear because you do not have a scooby what is underneath you. Apparently, the deepest part of the world's ocean that people have found is over 11 kilometers deep. So you could be lying, starfished, looking down into the ocean, knowing that if you had the ability, you could walk down for two and a half hours before you hit the bottom. That is as deep as it is far from this point to Pennycook or Musselboro. That, that's deep, isn't it? What's beneath you? You do not have a Scooby-Doo, do you? And that's the point. Depth is deeper than us. And Paul is saying God's wisdom and his knowledge are like an ocean that is infinitely deep. His riches, his resources are bottomless. Never mind two and a half hours of walking or swimming down. You could swim for the rest of forever and never hit the bottom of God's wisdom and his knowledge. Bottomless. And here's why Paul's saying that. Whatever questions you're asking this morning, whatever you are going through, you can trust that because God's knowledge is deep and his wisdom is rich, 
that everything that he does for you, his judgment will be just. And everything, every path he leads you down will be perfect. Because there is a depth of wisdom and knowledge that means no question you will ask or no place that you stumble or no thing that you are struggling with will stump or exhaust or diminish his wisdom and knowledge. He is infinitely deep. Some of us who are in uh, suffering and sorrow know that we expend a lot of mental energy and suffering trying to find out why God is doing what he is doing. And when our souls are filled with questions, what we're often doing is trying to attempt to trace the path that God is leading us on. God, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? But searching for an answer is sometimes like searching for an answer in an infinitely deep ocean. Did you lose your wedding ring at Port Ban, swimming in the sea? We could go to Port Ban now and we could search for Josh's wedding ring. How long would it take us to find it? Forever. It's gone. And sometimes that's like trying to trace God's path in the middle of your suffering. It's like trying to find Josh's wedding ring. But the reality is because God's knowledge and wisdom are as infinite as anything could be infinite, he knows. Our capacity for wisdom and knowledge is like a shot glass. Do you think you can take all of God's wisdom and get it into your little shot glass sized brain? No. Which means we will never fully be able to understand what God is doing in this world. Never. But Paul is saying more than you need an answer from God, you need awe at the depth of God. You might not be able to trace him, but you can trust him. You can. All that he has got, all of this depth that he has got means he has got you. And more than answers, we need all. For me to like starfish in the depth of the ocean, looking down at 11 kilometers would lead to fear. But actually, when you're a starfish looking down at God's depth, it doesn't lead to fear, it leads to faith. I can trust him. He's deep. And even if I can't see it, I know he can. That's the first thing. We need to keep moving, right? He's not just responding to someone deep. He's responding to someone unique. Look at verse 34. You get three questions. Who's known the mind of the Lord? Who's been his counsellor? Who's ever given to God? that God should repay them. There are three questions that have the same answer. Who's known the mind of the Lord? Answer. Nobody. Who's ever been his counsellor? Answer. Nobody. Who's ever given to God that God should repay them? Answer. Nobody. Now these three questions are taken from two stories in the Old Testament part of the Bible. And what struck me as I've read them this week is that both stories share the same emotions as this bit of Paul's letter deep sorrow, unceasing anguish, and questions about justice. But as well as sharing the same anguish, both these stories are prescribed the same solution. Oh, let me tell you the story. The first one comes from a prophet called Isaiah. And Isaiah was someone sent by God to speak God's word to God's people. And by chapter 40 of Isaiah's book, God's people are proper discouraged. But what Isaiah prescribes for their big discouragement is a big view of God. The answer is awe. And so Isaiah 40, where this is taken from, starts by saying, Comfort, comfort, oh my people. But comfort to Isaiah's people comes from him considering the incomparable God. He's unique. Listen to the questions he asks. Isaiah says to his people, comfort, comfort, who has 
measured the breadth of the heavens with the breadth of his hand. So from furthest galaxy to furthest galaxy, God can do that and measure it between thumb and forefinger. He asked the question, who has held the oceans in the hollow of his hand? The Pacific, the Atlantic, the North Sea, everything, just circling about in the hollow of his hand. He says, who's weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Pentland Hills on one side, Himalayas on the other, and he, he weighs them on his scales. Listen to this. He says, surely the nations... Or like a what? What would you compare America, Australia, Ukraine, Russia, Lebanon, Israel? What would you compare them to? You know what God says? All the nations are like a drop in a bucket. Not a bucket full of water, a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. All the nations. We made pancakes this morning. Put the pancake mix on the scales. Some goes in the bowl, evidently some doesn't, thanks to Keenan. You make the pancakes, you look at the scales, and there's pancake dust. Do you know what the reading on the scales was? Zero. All the nations. <sighs> dust on the scale. And so as I ask the question, to whom will you compare me? The voice of God. The answer? No one. Comfort for God's people comes from him being incomparable. The answer is all. Oh. The second story, that third question, who showed, uh, who's ever given to God that God should repay him, comes from a man called Job. And again, Job shares the same ang anguish, but he is given the same awe oh answer. If you don't know Job's story, very quickly, all his livelihood was stolen. All his employees were murdered. All of his children were killed in the house collapse. And then he himself is tortured with intense physical suffering. Brutal. In terms of people, almost incomparable, almost unique. And most of the book of Job, and it is a long book, is taken up by Job's friends offering shallow and superficial answers. They're trying to search out God's judgment. They're trying to trace his hand. And it goes on for a long, long time until God interrupts their shallowness with his unique depth. And God comes and he speaks to his suffering servant Job and he says, Job, where were you? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation?" He asked you, have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? He says to suffering Job, do you send lightning bolts on their way? He asks him, who has the wisdom to count the clouds? And then he offers this question that Paul grabs, who has ever given to God that God should repay? Him? The ultimate answer Job needs in his suffering is not an answer. The answer is, Oh, there's three questions, two stories, one answer. Oh, Isaiah's exiles, your minds are too small to know God's will or counsel him, but oh, his bigness will comfort you. He will bring you home. Job, you are and your resources are too small to put God in your debt as if you deserve anything from him, but oh, his bigness will vindicate you and restore more than what has been lost. Do you see how what Paul is prescribing to the Romans is the repeat prescription that God frequently gives to suffering people? Hard questions, hard people, hard things, hard emotions get the answer of the bigness of God. And if you look at verse 36, Paul only takes us deeper and continues to grow Uniquer. Look at this, 36. For from God and through God and for God are, what are the next two words? All things. On Monday, 
um, me, Dylan and Josh jumped on a train to go to Nottingham. Uh, it was about a five hour trip, two trains, about two and a half hours each-ish. Dylan necked a red bull and then fell asleep. <laughs> Amazing ability. Caffeine and then zonked. Josh fell asleep with him, so I moved to the other table to give him space. And I started working on Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36. And for the first train journey, pretty much, was studying this. We then swapped trains at crew, and we had another couple of hours, and we got onto playing Uno. Um, first to five, Josh won five games, Dylan won three, I won two. But having studied this on the first train, to then playing Uno on the second train, when I turned over my first card, green five, I had Romans 11.36 in my head. From him and through him and for him are all things. The green five was included in the all things. That's how big he is. That's how deep he is. That's how unique he is. That even that green five is from him, through him, and for him, as the one of deep knowledge and wisdom, of the one of unique, uncreated creatorness. Why did Josh win? It was from God, it was through God, it was for God. Now, if your mind is even vaguely engaged, that should fill your heart with even more questions. What if the Uno card that I have been dealt is not just a green five, but it's bereavement? Or it's abuse? Or it's dementia? Or it's cancer? Or it's redundancy? Or it's depression? Or it's childlessness? Or it's war? And even as your pastor, I'm here going, I don't know. I can't search that out. I can't, I can't trace that. There is no simple answer. I think there's just a correct posture. God is uniquely big. And I am unbelievably small. I am a lump of clay. That's what we saw a few weeks ago that could rightly be disregarded. I am a withered branch that should rightly be cut off and thrown into the bin. But he is the pro gardener who can take a lump of clay and make it into something beautiful. And he is the master gardener who can take something worthy of being cut off and make it into something fruitful. And the place that I can trace that to, and the place that I can search out, is that he has done that in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's son that is the ultimate thing that makes Paul's soul gasp. Oh. God's son Jesus is the one who could measure the heavens with the breadth of his hand. God's eternal son, Jesus, is the one who could hold the oceans in the hollow of his hand. And yet the pro-potter becomes small enough for his hands to be nailed into a cross. The potter becomes a lump of clay. God's son, Jesus, is the master gardener who makes the whole world fruitful. And yet he surrenders himself to become a cut-off branch who is cursed for a debt that he did not owe. The eternal Son of God becomes a withered branch to be chucked into your brown bin. Someone so deep and unique becomes so common and cursed for people so small and sinful as us. And so we gasp. And so if the potter can bring something so beautiful from nail-pierced hands, 
And if the gardener can bring something so fruitful from a cut off branch, I can trust that he is both deep enough and unique enough to take whatever uno card I have been dealt and turn it into something beautiful and fruitful. It is all part of the all things. We may not be able to trace him, but the cross and the resurrection of Jesus says we can trust him. And so Paul's final words are, Oh, to God be the glory forever. Amen. That's what, when the soul gasps, oh, the speech says, to God be the glory. Now we all do that to someone or something. We could turn into a blank and say, to blank be the glory forever. Amen. And we all fill in the blank in different ways. To my football club, be the glory forever. Amen. To my addiction, be the glory forever. Amen. To my career, to that bank balance, to that partner, to that whatever, be glory forever. Amen. But when you exchange God for something else in that blank, when you exchange something so deep and unique for something so common and shallow, you will only ever fall short of God's glory. If you insert into that blank to something like clay be the glory, you will become less than a lump of clay. When you say to this withered branch, my career, my whatever, be the glory. You will become less than a withered branch. When you exchange God's glory, you become less in God's glory. But the message of Romans is, when you give God glory, he transforms you into a glory like his sons. When you give God glory, he transforms you into something strong and purposeful and fruitful like a beautiful vase or like a flourishing tree and so he says to us in our sorrow this morning and in our anguish and in our questions get that right reflexive O to put you in a right posture with the deep unique creator God and instead of falling short of his glory, you actually are fulfilling what he made you to be. The answer is all. Oh.